sorry. I just want to stop the transcription. Mm -hmm. All right. And well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, vertical integration session. Thank you very much for joining us after a public holiday. Um, this is going to be a great session today. We've got uh, Dr. Michelle Reese with us, who's going to be talking about diabetes reversal. So that's going to be a great topic. I'm Sandy Vincent from the PHN education team, and I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we all live and work on and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. As always, this session is being recorded, so you will have access to that after the session. Um, during the present presentation, please mute your mics, but obviously we would love you to participate in the discussions. Um, and you can use the chat box as well to put your questions in there. There will be an evaluation as well, which I will post in the chat box, uh, the link for the Slido evaluation. So please, we'd be grateful if you complete that. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Michelle, who's going to do the presentation, and I'm going to just share my slides. Let me know if that is looking OK for everybody. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks very much for the introduction and thanks everybody for joining um, on the first morning back to school after Anzac Day, as Georgia said earlier. So it makes it a little bit um, rushed, I'm sure, for everybody. Um, but thanks again for inviting me and um, it's a pleasure to um, talk about a topic that's really uh, dear to my heart. And I think, you know, obviously something we see in general practice very often. Um, so the topic is type 2 diabetes um, reversal or remission. It's something that's becoming fairly popular right around the world. Um, and there's a debate as well around those the wording reversal or remission, but I'll get into that during the course of the slide. Thanks, Andy. Sorry, give me a second. I'm just having trouble changing the slide. OK. Um, so just by a quick way of introduction, um, so I'm a GP, um, worked and lived in Canada for a while, then came to Australia. Um, and then about five or six years ago, did my international certification in lifestyle medicine. And I have my fellowship. Thanks, Andy. Um, so what is type 2 diabetes remission? Um, it is defined by the um, Diabetes Australia as of 2021 um, as having an, a hemoglobin A1C of less than 6.5%. In other words, if your HbA1c was higher and you've managed to drop it below that, that percentage, um, that it is sustained for at least three months and that it needs to be that after stopping your glucose lowering medication. In other words, that you are no longer on medication. It's also important to note that remission may not be permanent. Um, you know, as GPs, we all understand why that may be the case. Um, and that even if you have reversed um, or put your diabetes into or patient's diabetes into remission, it still requ requires ongoing diabetes management and regular diabetes health checks for obvious reasons that at any point in time, those patients can obviously um, start increasing their um, HbA1c's. So the question is type 2 diabetes remission or do we reverse it? Um, as I said, that's become a, um, a fairly hot point of debate around the world. <clears throat> According to Diabetes Australia, um, the thought is that generally the term remission should be used um, rather than the word reversal. They say that remission in type 2 diabetes is not a cure and there is not necessarily permanent reversal of the underlying cause or pathology. And that remission simply means that the patient has a HbA1c less than 6.5%. However, I'm going to um, try and explain through the course of this presentation that, thanks Andy, I don't necessarily agree with that and I'll explain why. And then I'd love to hear your thoughts about this after this talk as well. So 
if we were to assist patients to reverse their diabetes, what could they achieve? What would that look like for the patient? Obviously, they'd have better daily glucose readings. Um, they would be able to drop and improve their hemoglobin A1C rather than just maintaining it or, or um, uh, causing it to deteriorate. Um, they'd be able to reduce or come off medications. Um, they would reduce their doctor and allied health visits. Obviously, they would reduce their complications, you know, kidneys, <clears throat> cardiac, amputations, eyes, all of those things that we need to follow up annually or, or, or twice uh, every second year with. Um, they would save money because they'd reduce medication costs and testing strip costs and all of those things. Thanks, Annie. And it's quite something to be diagnosed with a chronic disease that you've always thought or were originally told that it's something that you're going to have for the rest of your life. But to have that thought and that feeling that you no longer have diabetes obviously could have a significant um, biopsychosocial effect on that patient, particularly knowing that they have put their disease into remission. Thank you. Over the last few years, we've seen a lot of talk around um, bariatric surgery being used for diabetes remission um, for obvious reasons that by losing weight, um, it changes a whole range of hormonal things. Um, losing weight obviously has a big impact on all comorbidities, um, but it also changes the hormonal function um, within the GI tract. So there's literature, and I've mentioned um, and listed a range of studies at the bottom there um, that uh, does highlight the evidence for bariatric surgery and rapid weight loss um, and the reversal of type 2 diabetes or um, dropping hemoglobin A1Cs in diabetes. Long-term evidence around that doesn't yet exist. Um, thanks, Ed. There's also evidence around following um, ketogenic diets. And the next picture there, Sandy, is on our very low energy diets. So your VLEDs or VLCDs, um, very low calorie diets, generally um, achieved by using um, shakes and um, reduced calorie intake. Um, what I thought I would explain, um, and I'm sure most of us know this, but it's sometimes nice to just have a refresher and um, a little um, animation um, goes a long way, particularly to explain to patients how insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes works. So essentially, what I explain to my patients is that um, insulin fitting into the insulin receptor is like a lock and key mechanism with insulin being the key and the receptor being the lock. And um, under normal functioning circumstances, that key fits into the lock, opens the glucose channel door, and glucose moves intracellularly um, from, with, from the blood. Thanks, Andy. I know the slide is a little bit grainy, but um, I use it a lot to show patients, um, and I have yet not found one that's better than this. Um, but on the left-hand side, you'll see that uh, under normal insulin metabolism, you have your insulin key, essentially, so your insulin molecule that attaches to your insulin receptor, and that allows for the flow of your glucose molecules intracellularly. On the right hand side, um, you can see that there's damage. It's shown as damage. Um, it's obviously a slightly different path um, pathophysiological process, but the insulin molecule um, struggles to effectively attach to the receptor. And you have buildup of your glucose molecules um, within the bloodstream and um, essentially lower intracellular glucose um, because that facilitation of glucose uptake is inhibited with insulin resistance. Thank you. So 
When we have obesity um, or increase in adipose tissue, the um, excess fat storage, so the storage of the of the excess calories actually um, becomes inflammatory. Um, we know over the last couple of decades that a lot of research has gone into inflammation and the inflammatory processes that we see um, underlying and underpinning our um, most common chronic disease. Um, but within that adipose tissue, as the adipocytes um, enlarge and duplicate and, um, uh, you know, just grow in size and number, um, you see a, a tremendous inflow of macrophages and a whole cascade of um, inflammatory processes follow. Um, there's a release of um, cytokines and interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factors that sets off that inflammatory cascade um, and precipitates things like insulin resistance, cardiovascular disease because of endothelial inflammatory responses, um, cancer, etc. Um, and that shortens lifespan and, and obviously can um, lead to premature death and comorbidities and a range of complications. Thank you. Um, this slide um, I use for patients as well. It just shows that as those fat globules um, multiply and enlarge and, and undergo um, apoptosis over time, so you have the M1 activated macrophages. It leads to a cascade, as I said earlier, of tumor necrosis factors and a whole range of other things that then, thank you, Sandy, um, the inflammation then causes um, the fat tissue to become insulin resistant. Um, and not only the fat tissue that then spills over into um, the rest of our tissues, including things like um, our liver, um, it does lead. So if we have um, hepato um, steatosis, so fatty liver, um, it's a major indication, obviously, of underlying metabolic inflammation. Um, our the muscles and all the other tissues um, become insulin resistant resistant as well. So this slide um, is just a easy animation that I do use for patients to show that um, metabolism is a process that happens in all our cells and essentially means that what you've eaten or what you have stored in your fat cells um, be, is converted to energy at the end of the day. Thanks, Sandy. You may just want to flip through these um, probably fairly quickly. So this is a mitochondria. Um, basically, each cell takes oxygen and our basic glucose fuel molecule and converts it to ATP energy with the byproducts of carbon dioxide and water. Um, the process happens in that direction, and um, I put that in there because it's important for patients to notice that um, you'll see as I, as I go through this animation that the direction of that metabolism is important when it comes to lifestyle change. Thanks, Andy. So the glucose needs to enter the cell through that glucose channel with the lock and key mechanism, as I explained earlier. Thank you. It allows for the flow of glucose molecules to move intracellularly so that the um, energy can be produced for daily function of every cell. If your intake, so if those glucose molecules exceeds the flow of that metabolic pathway, um, the glucose uh, then needs to be stored, goes into the adipose tissue, as the adipose tissue increases, um, you then develop that metabolic inflammatory response, which leads to insulin resistance. And that um, effectively reduces the um, lock and key mechanism. Thanks, Sandy. And you have a buildup of glucose molecules extracellularly. Thanks, Sandy. And as a result, you have less glucose intracellularly. It stands to reason that if you have less glucose intracellularly, you actually then have less energy production and less function. So in order to reverse this process, if you have um, in uh, increased fat tissue and particularly your visceral fat, um, you need to reduce, for a period of time, you need to reduce your energy intake. 
which is what happens with bariatric surgery and very low energy diets, etc. So that you activate the storage in the fat cells. And then if you actually exercise and assist by um, moving that metabolic process in that direction, such as with cardiovascular exercise, etc., um, you can actually increase your basal metabolic rate um, and by reducing your um, the fat storage, you will reverse your insulin resistance, which is why type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance is a reversible process um, that essentially can be put into remission. I do show patients that with um, needing to, to lose weight, they... The, um, they do need to exercise to a point where they increase their heart rate um, because the byproducts of this energy metabolism is obviously carbon dioxide and water, which is mostly released um, in our breath. You know, with mask wearing over the last few years, it's been pretty obvious that we actually lose a lot of moisture as well as carbon dioxide, as we know, um, in our breath. Most patients, if you ask them, will say that, oh, you know, yeah, we lose water through urine or through our skin, but most of it actually comes out in our breath. So if patients are exercising um, and they want to lose weight, they actually have to exercise to a point where they do huff and puff a bit. Thanks, Andy. OK, so this slide is actually really old and we've known this for a very long time, um, but most of the patient population still believe that type 2 diabetes is a disease that they've just acquired and will have forever. Um, but the natural history of type 2 diabetes is actually a progressive deterioration um, of islet cell dysfunction over time in the setting of insulin resistance, which is why a lot of patients with progressive type 2 diabetes will end up on insulin. Um, however, it's probably expected that about 500,000, so half a million people in Australia are living with undiagnosed type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes and don't know it, largely because we don't always test for pre-diabetes. Um, thanks, Andy. So diagnosis occurs at that diagnosis line, um, and historically we've diagnosed type 2 diabetes using, using um, you know, our two-hour OGTTs. Um, given the definition now of diabetes remission, um, it also potentially could mean if you have a, di a hemoglobin A1c of more than 6.5%. If you're in the pre-diabetic category or, um, you know, for academic purposes, often, you know, we could ref try and specify between impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance or any of those other terminologies that have been used for insulin resistance. Um, but that category between, so NGT is normal glucose um, tolerance or just normal, you know, being non-pre-diabetic or non-insulin resistant. But if you're in that middle yellow category, Essentially, your hemoglobin A1c could lie between 5.7 and 6.5. Um, you could have a fasting glucose of more than 10, but that is in the setting of other factors such as visceral fat, hypertension, um, indicators of insulin resistance, um, such as, uh, you know, increased abdominal girth, um, any, um, uh, you know, the, the brown patches on the skin, I am, um, what's that called? Um, oh, it's just slipped my mind. I can tell you it's knee grants um, and any of those other indicators of um, insulin resistance, or you could diagnose it obviously with your glucose tolerance test. Um, there are other tests as well that the endocrinologists use. Um, so for patients, if we do test them um, and they do fall into that category, it's a really good time to then educate patients. And, you know, in some cases, we may put them on metformin. <laughs> the point. Otherwise, um, if they are aware that given ongoing um, poor lifestyle choices, increased weight gain, etc., over a period of time, they are potentially going to um, spill their insulin resistance over into type 2 diabetes or their pre-diabetes into diabetes. Um, I see a range of um, 
teenagers that um, come to my practice as well. And it's unbelievable how many of our teenagers these days already have um, pre-diabetes. So it's important to discuss that. Otherwise, they'll end up with um, type 2 diabetes probably before the age of 30. Thanks, Sandy. <coughs> As diabetes progresses, as we know, you know, one medication, metformin, can turn into two or three or four in combination of medications over time um, as they move right on this graph um, to the point where they then um, develop islet dysfunction and um, require long-term insulin. However, most patients don't know that um, with reduction in weight, big changes in, in lifestyle change, um, activating exercise, improving gut health, and um, all of those other lifestyle things, diabetes um, and insulin resistance, which really is obviously what di type 2 diabetes is. Um, that whole spectrum is insulin resistance, not just the pre-diabetic part, um, but it is um, reversible. Thanks, Sandy. So, of the increase in type 2 diabetes um, in the last 50, 60, 70 years, um, about, thanks Andy, 100% um, is largely due to lifestyle choices. Um, as of the census of 2016 um, from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, from midlife onwards, um, the top five causes of, and it's not on the slide, it's on another slide I use, the top five causes of um, death from about 50 upwards are lifestyle-induced choices, um, which is obviously a lot what we see in general practice and in our hospitals. Um, you know, there's the, the incidents and present presentations of all our acute conditions um, is totally um, surpassed by our chronic disease manifestations. I actually had an interesting discussion with our head of Gosford Emergency, um, Chris um, Trithui, yesterday, particularly on this topic. Um, thank you. Um, so just coming back again to diabetes remission, reversal or cure. Um, so a reminder again about what um, the accepted um, definition is. Thanks, Sandy. And the reason why I don't agree is why would we only aim for um, a hemoglobin A1C of less than 6.5% just to say that diabetes is in remission? Because essentially patients still have insulin resistance um, and this is the reason why that terminology and that definition has been um, um, floated is because most of our literature reflects studies done using bariatric surgery, very, very low energy diets and, and ketogenic diets. Most of these are not sustainable. So I don't quite, thanks Sandy with my next point, I don't quite um, understand why um, you would only use a definition of at least three months because that, thanks Andy, because three months is really not clinically significant in my opinion. Um, I think it's really important for patients to understand that their underlying um, issue is insulin resistance and that has a much larger um, impact on their comorbidities and their overall general metabolic function. Um, if we were to focus mostly on bariatric surgery, very low energy diets and ketogenic diets, most of these are non-sustainable. Um, the studies are being done because there is financial backing in a lot of these and they are easily quantifiable. It's a lot more difficult to um, quantify changes in um, with using lifestyle modification only. However, if we're able to achieve that, um, any reversal that we see in a hemoglobin A1C of more than 1% obviously has significant um, complication reductions. It sees a patient reducing medication. Um, I think, you know, putting patients into remission, meaning that they're off glucose lowering medication is incredible. Um, but even just reducing medication load and side effect burden, I think, is clinically significant for our patients. Um, 
by reversing HbA1cs, we also reduce comorbidities, we'll lower emergency admissions, and we'll incre- improve patients' quality of living, given that the underlying issue is metabolic inflammation, which has a much larger clinical impact than just the number alone being 6.5%. So in my opinion, I think we should use both terms and we should address both reversal and remission and not just look at it um, um, very singularly. Um, So I think if patients are able to make sustainable lifestyle habit and behaviour change, then significant remission is probable um, and, you know, provided patients um, understand how reverting to old habits and regaining weight and all of those things obviously can then um, um, cause their uh, disease to reoccur or to ignite again, should we say. Thanks, Andy. So what does lifestyle modification mean? It means that we're not just managing the disease. Up until now, I think type 2 diabetes has mostly just been managed through medications and regular monitoring, etc., It's actually important to address the cause being um, the underlying metabolic inflammation and the significant impact on all systems. Um, I think an evidence-based approach to lifestyle modification and behavior change is required. Um, It's important that weight loss is achieved not just through numbers, but through actual gut health change. Um, It's important to obviously reduce that energy excess food intake um, and and, um, it's important to lift that basal metabolic rate. Um, Very often we see with sudden weight loss, um, ketogenic diets, etc., that the basal metabolic rate actually reduces or stays low. Um, Ultimately, we need to um, focus on reducing the overall metabolic inflammatory process um, by addressing all lifestyle factors biopsychosocially. Um, Lifestyle change does no harm um, and has no side effects and um, probably is the best medicine we have. It is the cause um, and there is no... Um, you know, reduction in um, um, mor- or, or should I say increasing morbidities as we often see with um, surgery and a whole range of other things. However, there is a space for everything and obviously we need to address patient care as a totality as well as make it person-centred um, and obviously evidence-based. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you. So um, if we were to address the patient biopsychosocially, not just physically or biologically, um, we would see in the sphere of biological, we'd see improved sugar control, we'd see reduced metabolic inflammation. Um, We'd be losing that excess fat, which um, is that inflammatory drive. Um, we'd see improved um, medication com- um, side effect and reductions and reductions in medications, obviously, themselves. Um, we'd see improved complications um, on all organs, um, phys- uh, psychologically. And I think with my experience, this is where the largest part of this sits, is to improve habits, which improves self-esteem, self-talk, um, self-regulation, etc. And then socially, it will um, improve our, um, our health care budgets, save money for the patients as well as for um, the government, um, add more energy, sense of vitality and add quality of life. So I think it's a much bigger picture than just focusing on a number and a time frame of three months. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Michelle. There was so much in that. And I really, yes, yeah, so I haven't really thought of it in terms of that definition of it. Um, we're always striving to get their HbA1c down low, but I like that idea to help motivate the patients with getting them into sort of you know, remission. But as you said, it's still an ongoing process. So let's open the open the room for questions. I'm sure there are many. 
and you're most welcome to either write in the chat box or just unmute. I'll ask a question if anyone can see me. <laughs> um, hi, Michelle, that was fantastic. Um, I had a quick question. I got, I think I got a little bit confused about the remission and the reversal comments sure. and how potentially you would talk about that with a patient. Because in my mind, saying remission is probably a, a good option because it shows them that this isn't a permanent thing. Now that you're out of diabetes, you need to maintain these lifestyle changes, otherwise it's going to come back. But I can understand from a, um, a self-talk perspective this, just the fact that they've reversed it is amazing and maybe the reversal term is good for that. So I'm just wondering how you would word it to them and which which patient would you use which term? Yeah, so um, I use both terms. So to me, reversal means that um, you're reversing or improving your hemoglobin A1C. You know, I have patients that have presented with um, hemoglobin A1Cs of, say, 10%. And with lifestyle change, they're able, within months, they're able to, probably the best um, um, improvement I've seen is from 10.4 to 5.8 in a matter of six months. Now, medication can't do that. Um, but I think, as I've said as well in the, in the um, talk, that any reversal in a hemoglobin A1C, any improvement, actually has a statistical significance for that patient in terms of their long-term comorbidities, um, their overall sense of energy and vitality. So when I talk to patients, I'll talk about, okay, well, let's see how and if you actually can reverse your diabetes, as in, you know, we monitor that through a hemoglobin A1C. And if you're able to drop your HbA1c below 6.5, then following definition, you then are in reversal, uh, sorry, in remission. However, if you're able to drop it below 5.8, 5.7, then you've actually, you no longer have insulin resistance. And I've had a couple of patients that I've done that with one lady. And, you know, you look at the literature too, and it says, oh, you know, there's maybe a 50% of patients that be able that will be able to reverse or put their diabetes into remission. And theoretically, it's those who've maybe only had diabetes for about five years or less. I had a lady about three weeks ago who's had diabetes for 10 years and it's really nice, obviously, on our computer software. I'm not sure what you use, but we can like literally click and drag from um, current medical um, conditions, you know, into past history. And I sort of took her to type 2 diabetes. She initially presented with an HbA A1c of about 7.7 .7 or something, and she dropped it to 5.6. So I took it right out of the current and dropped it into past. And she walked out into the waiting room and she announced to the whole waiting room, I no longer have diabetes. I've had it for more than 10 years. So, you know, it's really fulfilling and it's amazing for patients. And um, and that's why I think even that bit of reversal, and that's where that whole biopsychosocial comes in, is because if a patient can feel, oh, look, I'm improving, and I was on four diabetic medications, now, now I'm on three, I want to be on two, maybe, maybe I can come off at all. And obviously it's not going to work for everybody, but if they understand what their reduction in complications. So I've got another lady who's been going on really, really well for about four or five years. And her main thing was, Michelle, I don't want to lose my toes. <laughs> So, you know, if she can keep, and she she can't actually come off all her meds. She has improved it. She's come off her antihypertensives um, at least, but she's still on um, two um, diabetic meds. She cannot drop her HbA1c lower than about 6.3, 6.4. She's tried really hard, um, but at least she's not traveling at an HbA1c of 8 or 9%. And she's able to keep it pretty low, and she's probably going to keep her toes for the next 10 to 15 years. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Michelle, if, if I can say something, I, I find that the huff and puff in exercise is one of the hardest part to <laughs> motivate people for and with even from the 35-year-olds who 
are starting to be overweight and I can show them the insulin resistance, often the weight gain after their children and their pregnancies, um, you know, 10 kilos easy over, you know, five year and two children later. And they make excuses absolutely nonstop. They do a little bit of walking the dog. And yes, some of them even join the gyms to the 65 year old and 70 year olds who have the knee pain, the ankle pain, the back pain, the blah, 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 blah. So there's some exercise that they do. And yes, they go on what we conventionally know, the yo-yo diets. You know, they do lose three or four or five kilos, but they're not any long anymore. The younger people will often say, I've exercised now for three months in the gym with a personal trainer. I spent a fortune and I haven't lost a thing. Is there any, what do you recommend to these people? I mean, other than obviously what, what you probably, you know, and when we see them in general practice, we see them for other things as well and often sort of you know, put into the consult, oh, by the way, I still haven't lost any money and I'm so frustrated. And maybe in your case, you make special appointments or they know that that's an appointment for their lifestyle. But that is one of the most frustrating thing that three years later, they still haven't improved on their insulin resistance and on their weight. And it's a constant cycle of frustration. Yeah, I, I fully understand that. And um, I guess because I, I I mean, I do a hybrid of general practice and lifestyle. So some yeah. patients are booked in for lifestyle only. So we only focus on that. Um, and many patients will say, but I am exercising, I am walking. And mm-hmm. and um, I because I, I, I like get into the nitty gritty of it. So I give patients food diaries and on that and, and it's a food and exercise log and it's across a whole week. And when a patient thinks I am exercising and they actually have written down what they've done, they've maybe gone once a week, maybe they've gone twice, and then they're walking their dog. Okay. And it's very, very different to actually, um, you know, you can you can sort of work out according to that calculation, you know, where a patient based on their age can actually push their maximum heart rate. Um, But if you show them a diagram like I showed today with that metabolism and they understand what needs to happen so that, and and we also use um, um, a body composition scale. Um, It's obviously not 100% science and um, we, I do explain that to patients, but it's excellent to show patients where, how much visceral fat they've got, how much um, total Um, fat mass they have and what their basal metabolic rate is and um, when you put that all together together with their bloods and you know their parameters and their blood pressures and all of those things and you then follow that up over a period of time and you show improvement that motivation actually can be pretty amazing Um, I do understand it takes time and it takes um, a bit you know it's not always that easy to do that in general practice um, but it's not just the focus is not just the physical. The focus is so much mental. And um, if there, there are certain tools that you can use to assist patients to move them along that stage of readiness to change, because that's part of what we miss as GPs is because we think that that's what they've got to do. It doesn't mean that they're ready. They're not at a stage to change necessarily. And part of our jobs, I think, is to assist patients in that shift of their stage of readiness. And many, many patients emotionally eat. And they may say to you, oh, but I don't eat much because I only have this for breakfast and lunch and dinner. But until you see it on a weekly food log where they actually then log all the incidental snacks and things and the emotional eating, a lot of it is mental. Um, and that's why it does it does take a little bit of understanding on how to assist patients. Those that have high self-efficacy, the patients you go, you know what, you know, you can actually do this. You can get off your blood pressure medication possibly. You can, you know, reduce your comorbidities. This is what you need to do. Those that have high self-efficacy are going to nail it and they just need a little bit of awareness and a bit of a reminder. But the majority of overweight patients 
actually have a lower sense of self-efficacy. They've got lower um, self-confidence, self-esteem. Their self-talk is pretty um, negative. And that is where true weight loss and lifestyle change comes in. And that is why sometimes, you know, there's a huge place for bariatric surgery. Obviously, you know, we work with the bariatric bariatric surgeons. There is a bit of a place for, um, you know, other things and, of course, medications and that. But none of those things are necessarily sustainable. Bariatric surgery, obviously, is a permanent change if you end up having a sleeve gastrectomy and that. And patients actually still have to change here to make that successful long term let alone all the potential complications and things that come with that. So it all starts here. Anyway, can no. we talk for hours? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So question, Michelle. So, so on, you know, because obviously you've got to look at the big picture, the holistic picture, but there are those patients that want their quick fix. So what is your sort of approach to patients that might specifically be requesting medication? Um, yeah, because obviously that goes against, you know, that whole exercise, eating well, but... Again, the patients often want that quick fix or just that head start just to help them. What's your, what's your approach to, from the medication point of view? Yeah, so um, there's definitely a place for a quick fix, you know, the prescription of medications. And obviously, we've got so many patients coming in wanting a Zempic these days. I'm sure we all see it. Um, and there's definitely a place for bariatric surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but my take on it is to make it sustainable, to have improvements in um, a person's focus on their internal sense of motivation and pride and achievement to make it sustainable, you've got to support those quick fixes with the ongoing um, biopsychosocial assistance. Um, in general practice, it does look like uh, it does mean that you've got to have regular follow-ups with patients which is what the literature shows anyway they do see us as um we're actually a really really key point of contact in achieving um sustainable weight loss because patients trust us um and they you develop that rapport generally um you know if you do true family medicine of course um and I think to answer your question about um, that quick fix, Georgia, it falls into the same category as any instant gratification. Okay, it's that dopamine drive and it's where if patients become aware of that need for a quick fix and how to change that and become aware of it, you actually then can work with the patient to support the quick fix with the longer term neurotransmitter change and neuroplasticity, which again is a whole separate discussion. Thank you. I think Chris has got a question there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just quick question. So, Michelle, in your experience with um, to sort of uh, to make effective change with these patients, how often do you need to see them and how many visits would you on average spend? Right? Because I've heard numbers like eight to 10 visits in the past or, you know, um, but it seems like, you know, how long is the string? But I guess as a GP, you know, is it a monthly visit? Is it a two-weekly visit? Um, yeah, because I, I understand it's not something where you just do one or two visits and it's solved. It seems to be a long game. But, um, yeah, from your experience, how, how often and how regular do you see these patients? Um, the easiest way to answer that, Chris, is just where are they in their stage of change? Because if they are still, say they're, just you know contemplating you're not going to get them there very often if they're actually starting to prepare you want to get them in fairly regularly and if they're busy actioning and you know okay i really i want to do this see them often if you're able to i'd suggest you see them every two to three weeks and it may even just be you know a quick 10 15 minute visit if you are inclined to sometimes want to make your appointments a little bit longer that's actually really helpful but that obviously depends on how you run your practice um but start off with going okay let's go with the physical first let's just see where you're at let's do your hba1c and your fasting insulin and your hemoglobin and your your um, blood pressures and your visceral fat if you're able to if you can't 
you know, if you can't um, afford one of those Tanita body composition scales, you know, obviously you go with your standard um, abdominal circumference measurements and all of those things. Um, and then start with those parameters look and, and bring in things like where are your triglycerides? Where do you have fatty liver? Um, look at that whole metabolic syndrome picture and then say, okay, well, next time you come in, let's talk about what are you doing? What are your habits? You know, if you wanted to ask patients to bring in a food log, bring in an exercise log, um, and then set little um, goals. Okay, we'll recheck your parameters again, you know, say in three months or six months, but come on in every two weeks. And even though we may use the scales, I'm not a strong supporter of going, okay, it's about the numbers because it's not about the numbers. The numbers are a nice side effect. If you actually start focusing on that internal motivation, that internal sense of pride and achievement and and that in driving that self-efficacy, um, you know, then the numbers actually just become a side thing. But part of what we can do as general practitioners is to assist with that monitoring and assist with that support. And it's a much longer conversation to have than what I can do right now, um, because there are quite a lot of tools that you can use, and I'm happy to have another chat about those things in the future. Um, but if the patients are then starting to action, say every two to three weeks, um, and then as they start understanding gut health and food change and they start feeling better and they start understanding, you know, the evidence behind proper eating, getting rid of your processed foods, cutting down on your refined carbohydrates, exercising so that you do huff and puff a little bit more because that obviously then drives a whole bunch of other neurotransmitters which makes them feel better and it's not just about that instant gratifications then you can actually um, start spacing out those visits so as they get it more and as they start gaining momentum you can then change from three weekly to maybe once a month or once every six weeks and later like i'll have patients now they just come for a check-in they come in once every six months and they're good because they've now shifted into maintenance, maintenance phase. Something to add to that is at any point in time, patients can lapse. And that's when they need to understand that it's, that's when they're going to come back again. And then, you know, they lapse, they come back and you just sort of get them back onto track again. And that sounds perfect. I mean, it makes total sense um, from a clinical point of view. I guess it's the billing side of things for me as well as like, um, so I would feel really bad privately billing a patient every two to three weeks. And um, do you have any tips on that? Like, uh, I guess it varies between patients, but like, how do you make this work? So yeah, obviously it's not about always about the finances, but as a practice, I guess, I would love to get them back every two to three weeks, but do you bulk bill them for those appointments? And you know, how does that work? Yeah, there's different ways that you can do that. Um, there are a number of GPs around the country that are introducing um, shared medical appointments. So that's a different discussion again. Um, you can, um, patients in the beginning, when they are interest, really interested and you've got them in the beginning, they are happier. You, you could do sort of like a, say, four week or a five or a six week package but at the first visit you then load the gap and then they bulk build later because obviously you can you've got to charge that gap at a visit at a point but they understand that um, or you could set up your practice in ways where um, you know depending on like a little package that you give them um, that there is um, a private charge to that that's unrelated to your item but it could cover other things. Um, and we've got a few more questions. So we've got Sarah, who's um, been, apart from an obviously highly processed, high fat sugar, uh, yeah, apart from the obvious, so highly processed, high fat sugar foods that need that patients need to be really aware of. What is your approach with regards to dietary specifics? Do you advocate low carb specifically or just all round fresh food? <laughs> yeah, um, it's got to be something that's sustainable. So um, we actually follow... I'd strongly encourage you, if you're interested, to look at the latest Canadian national food guidelines. Um, Canada changed these guidelines in 2000, in 2021. 
It also, um, if you went and looked at um, Dr. Joanna McMillan, um, Dr. Jo, if you just Google Dr. Jo, she's one of our top dietitians in Australia. She's a researcher as well. She's come out with a very, very simple way to um, assist patients with how to think about food. So when it comes to food, you want to make it simple, easy to follow, not about the numbers. You don't have to go away and count and count calories and all of those things because none of that's sustainable and it leads to ridiculous negative self-talk and yo-yo dieting over time. So the fundamentals really are you got to have real food, unprocessed. So look at ingredients lists, um, stay away from all of those refined, processed, white, carby products. A lot of patients think that they are gluten. You know, we're all here now. Everybody's, you know, gluten free and all of those things. Um, but so much of it is just in the refined, processed white carbs. So go whole grains, legumes, um, and it's about ratios. So if you look at the Canadian Food Guidelines or Dr. Joe, she comes. There's there's a food plate ratio that you can follow, that shows how much of it is your um, uh, your fresh vegetables and fruit in relation to your carbs, so your carb portion, although they whole grains and legumes, there's a ratio difference, and then there's a protein amount, and then you've always got to have your good fats. That actually means you're not excluding any major food group. You're not avoiding, you know, all carbs, and which is unsustainable for most people and obviously can have other issues. Um, and you're not, and you're still maintaining full nutrition. Um, so it's mostly plant-based, um, eating all food groups, reducing portion sizing, and then getting rid of, and, and part of that is about if you eat like that, you actually, um, uh, you know, go for a four hour period without needing those snacks in between because your whole grains and your proteins and your little bit of good fats actually sustain you for the full four to five hours. Um, and if you eat like that, and a lot of people get those munchies three, four o'clock in the afternoon because they may skip breakfast or they may only have a quick little, you know, sandwich or a little something for lunch, which is based on our, our Western diet is based on our refined carbs. Mm -hmm. And we know what they do with insulin and, and sugar metabolism. It's like the quick peak drop. And then you've got, you know, the munchies two or three hours later. Whereas if you follow what I've just said, you actually have that more sustainable insulin glucose metabolism you have your sustained um fiber that first of all helps with your gut as well which i haven't spoken about yet but that's also really important um and um it maintains your energy levels for a longer period of time um so real food unprocessed not too much and follow the right ratios simples <laughs> And Gordon's conveniently put the link in and he's made the comment, so we're back to being a swapper, not a stopper. So I like I like that. Yeah. So yeah. I think like that's a, 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 a program that was actually well. released in Australia back in 2008, I believe, and it was called a, Stop It, Don't Stop It. And I, it's one of my favourite campaigns that we ever released in Australia in regards to food. I'm just going to put in the, um, the link for you right there in the YouTube ad. Kind of, I love it. And I still use it now. Yeah. I love it. That's all yeah, that's the problem, unfortunately, with yo-yo dieting. You know, you've gone from like, you know, Atkins and keto and this and that. And, you know, uh, it's just patients just once you start talking to patients about it. And every time the problem is every time they fail on something, it lowers. It, it just obviously has that whole mental cascade down the road, too. So. And we've got Dimity with a question as well. With a hand up. Yes. Um, I just unmarked my unmuted myself. Um, thanks for that, Michelle. It's been great. Um I I've got this dynamic happening with a patient that I've known for like several decades, but has recently developed uh, type two diabetes in the last year. And and she's always been one who likes to deny things and doesn't like doctors much and stuff. And she comes from a family that's full of people with type 2 diabetes. And um, she she's probably moved from pre-contemplation now, but only after I'd, I'd done a 
blood test, told her to get another one, started her on something, and then, you know, she didn't get the second blood test for like six months. And then it was, she had a, a, a blood sugar of 18 and a hemoglobin A1C of 10 point something. And there were sort of urgent calls to her. And she went, oh dear, oh dear. And then, and now she, I, I can't get her to do regular blood tests. I've sent her to a diabetes educator who she really likes, which is good, but she doesn't like to go too often, maybe once every three to six months. She doesn't want to go to a dietitian. She is exercising and she's lost a whole lot of weight. And she said, I believe I can get rid of the diabetes if I do that. And so I've given her a form to get a blood test, but she said, I think I'll wait till June before I get that done. And I I feel like I'm hooked on the figures and I want to know what's happening. And, and I don't want to focus too much on her weight, but her weight's lost. She's lost lots of weight. So anyway, and she's exercising a lot more. But I, I suspect that she's going to stop as soon as she hits a certain level. And so what do you do with that sort of person? How do you, how do you keep them on track? Yeah, you know, there's, there's such a, complex response to that question because we are trained as experts and we still think so often as experts which is perfect if you have the patient with um you know an acute presentation like an mi you know or they come in with their svts or you know they've got a pneumonia or whatever it is it's great we've got the answers we're going to fix you we're going to do it and this is how it's going to work when it comes to a patient like that you got to change Number one, you've got to accept that we're not we're not going to cure everybody, right? We're not we're not necessarily going to going to help people. Everybody change, but you also you you have to also change your approach. So, have you heard about motivational interviewing techniques? So you've got to understand how to address that patient totally differently to how we've all been doing for ages and how we've been trained for the most part. Um, so. Um, it's it's I'd encourage you to um, use motivational interviewing techniques, practice them in and and just change the approach to that patient because you, with that patient, you're never going to tell her what needs to happen or what she needs to do. It's something that she has to start coming to a re realization about herself. There are little ways that you can, sort of nudge patients a little bit you know if you um if you talk about what's important to them really what are their values what's their purpose um you know sometimes you can bring a bit of danger in there a little bit it depends on how you want to play that um but you really want to empower that patient and sometimes if you have a patient with a personality disorder if they've got borderline personality disorder or something like that or you you can stand on your head. <laughs> You're not going to help that patient shift until they want to, if they ever want to. So, and then it's important to come into that mental health side of things. So any patient who's had significant trauma, PTSD, anything that has affected their um, sense of self-worth, um, um, that needs a whole different approach again because they, um, yeah, to empower them it would only happen if they can start lifting their, um, their sense of self-worth. That's great. Thanks, Michelle. That's good. I'll, re I'll have a look at my motivational interviewing notes from a few years ago and have another thing. Thank you. But that takes a hell of a lot of time and it's not easy in general practice to do that. So... <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I've known her for twenty years, and I know her family, so it's yeah. worth it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, awesome, Michelle. Thank you. And was, that was great discussion. I love having a little discussions at the end because uh, it just helps consolidate everything. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Michelle, and everyone for asking away with their questions. So I'll hand over Sandy in a sec to do the wrap up. Um, and don't forget to do the Slido. And in two weeks' time, we're going we're going to the beginning of the fussy toddler. So, um, you know, when the mum brings their child in and my little Johnny won't eat anything, 
and worried about him and his iron deficiency and all the rest. So we're going to be starting from the from the beginning. So um, yes, yeah, so and I think we've got some lucky door prizes to announce as well, Sandy. Is that right? Uh, actually, Georgia, I don't have that information. I'm sorry oh, okay. um, because <laughs> because I'm sitting in for Jenny today. Oh, yes. um, yep, yep, yep. I don't. So I'm um, apologies for that. Can we? Um, so, well, in two weeks' time, we can double up with our, we'll have a lucky door prize from, because we had to announce them last time and then from <laughs> today. So it's going to be a prize bonanza in two weeks' time. So be there. It will be. It will be. But we definitely have our list of participants for today. So don't worry, you're not going to miss out. I absolutely promise you that. <laughs> um, that was amazing, Michelle. Thank you. I'm so inspired. Um, really great. Thank you very much for that. Just, all I need to do is remind you, please, to do the Slido evaluation. I have put that link into the chat, chat and then join, to join us next um, in two weeks' time for another fantastic vertical integration. Um, Michelle, if I can ask you to hang on for a bit, and, uh, and Georgia, Chris and Dimity, that would be awesome. And it reminds me to say thank you very much for, for joining us, everyone. Have a great day today. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Lots of thank yous in the chat box as well, Michelle. Oh. Well, thanks, guys. <laughs> that was very well done. Thank you. Apologies, yeah. um, Michelle. I um, I couldn't go backwards with the slides, so I was a bit nervous. Oh. About... <laughs> Not to go too quick. It wouldn't go backwards when I tried to go backwards. I'm really sorry. So then I was trying to be very cautious about not going too fast. So, but anyway, um, so thanks for bearing with me with that. No, you did, you did really well there, actually, yeah, Sandy. Yeah, great. <laughs> it worked out all right. It did. It did. Yeah. Yeah. Considering that you're sitting in your car, I think we did a fantastic job. No, you did an amazing job. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was like going, oh, I hope this hotspot holds. So, yeah. Yeah, I was like, so I was thinking I was going, you must have a good hotspot. <laughs> Oh, Sandy, we can stop recording now. Did you want to? Oh, yes, of course. Yep. Sorry, let me do that as well. <laughs> so I always have to remember that. Yeah.